Good evening, and welcome to the Longmont Museum. My name is Justin Veach, and I'm the manager of the Stewart Auditorium. And guess what? This is the Stewart Auditorium. <laughs> welcome. Who's here for the very first time ever? Hey, wow, that's a lot of first timers. Welcome. We do a lot of, lot, a lot, a lot of stuff here. Um, you might want to pick up one of our new newsletters on your way out the door if you haven't already. Uh, it's got stuff in here through, well, well into May. We're doing a lot. We've got a great new exhibition up here featuring the work of Colorado-based contemporary artist Terry Maker. I really think it's a blockbuster show. We do uh, Thursday night programming. Every Thursday night we're doing something amazing here, including tonight. Actually, tonight kicks off our Thursday nights at the museum series. Uh, we've got films coming up. We have a great, uh, great program with KUNC that we're doing. Uh, we've got uh, concerts and films and talks galore. Just, just grab one of these, why don't you? Uh, do we have any uh, members with us this evening? Hey, thank you members. We simply can't do all that we do without you. And like I said, we do a whole hell of a lot, so thank you. I'd also like to thank the Scientific and Cultural Facilities District, otherwise known as SCFD, our media sponsor, KGNU, and Elevations Bank for supporting our Thursday night uh, series. Tonight, um, we, we're very happy to team up with our friends at the Longmont Public Library. They're like, uh, we're like fellow siblings here in the city of Longmont. And so uh, we're really glad to present this special library at the museum evening. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you the director of the Longmont Public Library, Nancy Kerr. Good evening and thank you to my brother, Justin. Um, <laughs> the Longmont Public Library is very pleased to collaborate with the Longmont Museum to bring you an evening with award-winning author, Pam Houston. Pam will share the stage with fellow Colorado author, Karen Avenin, to discuss Pam's new memoir, Deep Creek, Finding Hope in the High Country. Pam is also the author of two novels, Contents May Have Shifted and Sight Hound, along with collections of short stories and essays. Her stories have been selected for volumes of the O. Henry Awards, the Pushcart Prize, Best American Travel Writing, and Best American Short Stories of the Century, among other anthologies. She is the winner of the Western States Book Award, the Willa Award for Contemporary Fiction, my favorite from this list, the Evil Companions Literary Award, <laughs> and several teaching awards. I want to ask about that in the Q&A. <laughs> she teaches in the Low Res MFA program at the Institute of American Indian Arts, is professor of English at the University of California, Davis, and co-founder and creative director of the literary nonprofit Writing by Writers, which puts on between seven and 10 writer gatherings per year in places as diverse as Boulder, Colorado, Tomales Bay, California, and Chamonix, France. Pam Houston lives at 9,000 feet above sea level on her 120-acre homestead near the headwaters of the Rio Grande where she raises horses, donkeys, Icelandic sheep, and Irish wolfhounds. Our immensely capable interviewer this evening is author, poet, mountain woman, and professor, Karen Avenin. Karen is the author of the memoir, Rough Beauty, and her work has appeared in the New York Times, Lit Hub, Real Simple, and Westward. She presently teaches writing workshops at Lighthouse North and Film, pop culture and storytelling to freshmen at the University of Colorado Boulder, is the winner of two Academy of American Poets Awards, and has been nominated for several pushcart prizes in fiction. Now, imagine being 31 years old with, in quotes, no job, no place to lie except my North Face tent. That was Pam's situation as he sp she spent her royalties to purchase a 120-acre ranch near Creed, Colorado. As you can imagine, maintaining that kind of property did not come without its challenges. We'd like you to, to invite you to sit back and enjoy a conversation with Pam and Karen there will be a question and answer period afterwards, so be thinking about your questions. And we do have book sales available, um, si a book signing after the talk, and we would like to encourage you to patronize our local bookseller, Barbed Wire Books from Longmont. Thank you very much for coming, enjoy the show. I 
can't see, but I know you're there. Um, but I also can see that no one ever sits in the front row. Isn't that a funny thing? Um, anyway, um, thank you so much for coming out on a soon to be snowy night. I really appreciate it. I slipped over Kenosha Pass just before it got really gnarly this afternoon, but it was on its way to, um, to gnarliness. Um, I think because Karen and I are going to be talking about the book and um, talking about things, all things ranch, and because you have these beautiful pictures of the ranch up there to look at, I'm gonna read something uh, that I don't often read. Um, it's, a, it, it's a section of a long essay called Mother's Day Storm, which is about um, the death of my beloved Fenton Johnson, the wolfhound, and a, um, a, a elk calf that found its way into my barn, and also the climate catastrophe. But I am only gonna read um, one, one section, which is the, the Fenton section. In 2014, I lost Fenton Johnson, the wolfhound. Mother's Day weekend was his last, which I know from experience will make all the maze from now on a little sadder. 11 years is a big number for an Irish wolfhound and Fenton had made excellent use of every one. I named him after my dear friend, the novelist and essayist Fenton Johnson. And as Fenton the dog grew up, he revealed more and more ways the name was apt. Like Fenton the human, he was wise and reticent the best kind of grandfather, even when he was only middle-aged. He wasn't big on asking for affection, wouldn't wiggle up to you like a black lab or a Bernese mountain dog, wouldn't even very often bump his head up under your resting arm for a pet. He preferred to sit nearby, keeping a loving and watchful and ever so slightly skeptical eye as if the humans were always potentially on the verge of making a really bad decision. <laughs> and he would be ready, in that case, to quietly intervene. When Fenton was a young dog, he would bound through deep snow with an expression of such pure joy on his face, it could make even a non-dog person laugh out loud. He'd only drink water out of the very edge of a bowl and only then with his top teeth pressing firmly against the metal rim. When he wanted something, he would come over and scratch on the chair or the couch I was sitting on as if it were the wrong side of a door. When he was happy, for instance, if I rose from a chair with a leash in my hand, he would wag his tail heartily. But when he was ecstatic, like when I came home after a week of working on the road, his tail would make huge happy circles the scope of his happiness too big to be contained in a movement that only went from side to side. To say Fenton was intelligent, to say he had a wider range of emotions than anyone I dated in my 20s and 30s, <laughs> is really to only scratch the surface of what a magnificent creature he was. He was the ranch manager, hypervigilant but not neurotic, keeping an eye on everything, animals, people, making sure no one was out of sorts or out of place. Because of his watchfulness, he had perfected the art of anticipating what would happen next better than any person could have. He knew all of my tastes and my tendencies, and he was always ready to be of service in any undertaking, moving the sheep from one pasture to another, walking the fence line to look for breaks, riding into town to drop off the recycling, cheering me up on a sleepless night by resting his heavy head across one of my ankles, reminding me to get up from the computer after too many hours of writing and go take a walk outside. His last year though, the arthritis that first made itself known when he was about eight years old was getting severe. He'd been on Remedil, the canine version of Advil for years, we had had good results from acupuncture, massage, and glucosamine chondroitin. Doc Howard had shelved his country vet skepticism to give a laser gun a try and had been surprisingly impressed with the results, using it on many patients for pain relief, as well as on his wife and on himself. 
Once a week, I loaded Fenton into the Forerunner and we drove to Doc's, donned our Keith Richards goggles, and Doc's granddaughter gave Fenton six shots of laser light in his back end. Lately, even the laser gun treatments were reaching the point of diminishing returns. I'd been away for a few days in Boston when I got the call from Kelly, my ranch sitter, that Fenton was down and didn't seem to want to get up anymore. A wolfhound isn't meant not to be able to stand and walk around, however comfortable we might be willing to make him. Months before, I had written on my calendar the words, this weekend keep free in case Fenton. And there was the old boy, as obliging as ever, doing everything, even dying, right on time. I flew to Denver immediately and invited some of Fenton's closest friends to the ranch for the weekend, knowing that in order to come, they would have to brave the predicted Mother's Day blizzard during the five-hour drive from the front range to the ranch. In Boulder, I bought dry-aged organic beefsteaks for everyone I thought might make it, plus a mountain of other groceries. I figured if we were going to be sad, and we were going to be sad, at least we were going to have good food to eat. When I selected the steaks, the butcher, whose name is Jerry, and whose dog's name, I would learn later, is Gristle, took a lot of time and great pleasure describing the dry aging process. And when I asked for six T-bones, one for each of the potential guests and another for the old boy himself, Jerry said, he must be having quite a party. And since he had been so kind and thorough in his explanation, I said, well, what I'm actually doing is having kind of a living wake for one of the best dogs who's ever lived, and I want to buy the very best for him and for his friends who are making the drive up to my ranch in Creed to be with him. Jerry lifted one of the massive T-bones off the top of the pile sitting on the scale. You should have said so to begin with, he said. In that case, Fenton's is on me. My friend Tammy Anderson had a wonderful dog named Taylor who she was as deeply connected to, I believe, as I was to Fenton. I have loved all my dogs, of course, but there is the rare dog, I have had two so far in my life, that asked me to transcend my human limitations and be at least occasionally a little more evolved, like them. Fenton was such a dog and so was Taylor. Taylor and Fenton were puppies together and they loved each other truly all their lives. When Taylor was coming close to the end, she and Tammy would often lie on the bed together and look into one another's eyes. One day, Tammy told me, almost in a whisper, they were in such a position and Tammy said, maybe next time I'll be the dog. But Tammy couldn't be there for Fenton's weekend and neither could Greg, so it turned out to be me and Kelly and Linda who had cared for Fenton so often over the last five years of his life, he belonged to her nearly as much as he belonged to me. She had flown in from Reno and met me at the Denver airport and we had driven together. The storm had kept everyone else away. The weekend was everything all at once. It rained and snowed and blew and eventually howled and I slept out on the dog porch with Fenton anyway, nose to nose with him for his last three nights. The storm seemed to have been ordered especially for the old boy who loved the cold and snow most of all, who hated the wood stove and preferred it when I kept the house in the 55 to 60 degree range, who all his life would literally raise a disapproving eyebrow at me the moment he suspected I was going out to chop kindling. Linda and I gave him sponge baths and rubbed his face and ears until he didn't want us to rub his face and ears anymore, and then we sat quietly beside him. I will admit to even loving cleaning him up, changing his dog beds, washing and drying him, fine tuning my attention to meet his every need. When I could stand to tear myself away from him, I cooked giant pots of soup and pesto and grilled vegetables and salad. I had no appetite, but the kitchen was warm and smelled good whenever I walked into it. Fenton ate Jerry's giant dry aged T-bone in three sittings over two days and enjoyed the bone as much as I've ever seen him enjoy anything in his life, even though he had mostly lost interest in other food by then. There were times I was sure we were doing exactly the right thing by Fenton. Times I thought that if my last weekend could be like his, it would be better than pretty much anybody's last weekend I had heard about in the history of the world. Other times I was in a flat panic. How could I be trusted to make this decision? 
What on earth gave me the authority or the wisdom to decide when his quality of life had crossed over some determinate line? And all that aside, how would I live in a world without him, without his tender presence beside me, without his increasingly stiff rear end galumphing down the driveway to meet me, without his quiet vigilance as I sat in a chair and did my work? Fenton was my seventh Irish wolfhound and my tenth dog overall. I was not new to being the decision maker. But no amount of times down this difficult road made it any easier. At one point, I got myself so freaked out, I thought maybe we would get in the car together, just him and me, and drive and drive and see if we could outrun death. On Monday morning, I saw he was getting the very beginning of tiny sores from st sitting still for so long, and I knew Tuesday morning would have to be his last. My friend Kay Penner Howell called from Denver and said she had tried to make it on Sunday, but they had closed Highway 285 because of black ice, and so far it had not reopened. She asked me if I was okay, and I told her that I was. I've always called Kay the moral center of my large and wonderful group of women friends, in part because she was raised by preachers, in part because she has so much backbone, but mostly because she has a remarkable way of orienting toward true north. Kay and I have the exact same Prius, year and model. And when she pulled in the driveway 10 hours later, Fenton got more excited than I had seen him all weekend, even though I was sitting right there beside him. Like there might be two of me, and I might come home all over and start caring for him again, as I already was. This was another unexpected gift of the weekend. How many hundreds of times had I seen Fenton at the bottom of the driveway, his tail going in giant crazy circles? But because I was always the one in the Prius, I had never before witnessed that moment of recognition, the moment he became sure that car was my car. Who in your life has ever been that ecstatic over your arrival? Someone, I hope, some living being. But of course, it wasn't a second me who got out of the Prius. It was Kay. And when he recognized her, he danced and danced on his front legs only because he loves her too, and he knew she had come to see him. As a culture, whenever we want to treat someone or something inhumanely, we declare they don't have emotions. But anyone who thinks dogs don't have emotions should have been on the porch that night in the snow. Kay had driven 10 hours in whiteout conditions, doubling the length of the drive. When I asked her if it was awful, she shrugged. You never, ever ask for help. So after we talked, I figured I needed to get here. I don't think I asked for help this time. Maybe not, she said, but you were close. We bedded down on the dog porch in sleeping bags under the swirling snow. She said, you're doing the right thing, Pam. He's not going to get better. I said, it feels like a betrayal no matter what I do. And she said, I don't think betrayal is a word that belongs on this porch. I teach sometimes with the Colorado writer Laura Hendry, and she gives a craft lecture on something she calls the jaws of life character, the person who sweeps in and pulls your protagonist from the burning car just when it seems all hope is lost. Kay Penner Howell was my jaws of life character that weekend. She came just when all my intrinsic strength and broad-minded philosophy about the cycle of life was about to fail me. She drove 10 hours in a Prius on black ice to sleep on a hard wooden porch in a poorly rated sleeping bag with Fenton and me on his last night on earth. I didn't want to go to sleep because the hours were short now and I didn't want to miss a minute. After we had been quiet a while, a coyote barked and another howled back from a great distance. Before long and for the last time, Fenton joined their song. A few hours later when it was barely getting light, I lay nose to nose with him and petted his perfect ears and said aloud, you did such a good job, Fenton. You did such a good job taking care of me. He looked right at me, right into me. He wanted me to know he knew what I was saying. And I think you already know this, I said, but you don't have to be afraid. I didn't know where those words came from. If it were me getting the shot in the morning, I sure as hell would have been afraid. But I knew when I said them, they were the most important ones. In the gathering light, he looked in my eyes, not with fear exactly, but urgency. He said, now it's my turn to trust you. And I said, you can. 
and Al hooted, some geese honked and Kay stirred in her sleeping bag. One of the lambs started buying, Queenie probably, the one with the higher voice. I heard Roni nicker softly, heard him walk around on the crunching snow, somewhere in the distance, the sound of a woodpecker, all the sounds the ranch makes every morning. Doc Howard came at 10 through the snow to give Fenton the shot. Doc is getting older and he told me he would be sending his granddaughter in his place and I didn't protest though I know he heard the disappointment and fear in my silence so I was unsurprised and very grateful to see his small gray head behind the wheel. When I saw he did not have the sedative most vets give initially before they give the drug that stops the heart, he again heard my unasked question. Doc said, what's in this syringe is the world's biggest sedative. I don't like to mess around with lots of reactive drugs. Fenton was calm, almost smiling, for the very few minutes it took to put him to sleep forever. I believe he knew what was happening. I believe he was ready to put his head down on my lap one last time. Everybody cried, even Sweet Jay, Doc's brand new vet tech who had only met Fenton a couple of times. When I found my voice again, I told Doc the story about Jerry and the stakes, and he said, Pam, it turns out there are a lot of really good people in the world. After we loaded Fenton's body into Doc's truck to be taken to the morgue for cremation, Kay and Linda and I took a pasture walk in his honor a couple of inches of snow covered the ground, and the bluebirds who had returned recently hoping for better weather were almost too beautiful against the freshly whitened pasture to bear. The sun came out, and we fed all the equines apples and carrots from our hands. Eight hours later, I found myself back in the Denver airport, which was full of opportunities to do all the things I hadn't found the time or the wherewithal to do all weekend. Drink water, go to the bathroom, eat food. My plane was delayed two hours and the corn chowder at Elway's bar tasted miraculous. I was riding on something I recognize as having lived through the thing you thought you might not live through, adrenaline. I marveled at all the people around me who weren't grieving, who had had normal days in board meetings or at home with their kids. I wasn't sleep sleepy exactly. It was more like the insides of my eyes had been scoured with a Brillo pad. Fenton the human sent me a text saying Fenton the canine loved and was loved all his life and there is no condition in all our living and dying that could be more satisfying. As I waited for my plane, I found myself thinking back as I had many times that weekend to Jerry the butcher pulling that steak off the top of the pile. He might have thought what he did was a small thing though the price of those dry aged steaks makes it at least a medium thing, even by the most objective measure. But the relative magnitude of his kindness to me at that moment was frankly immeasurable. And I had held on to it all weekend and would continue to for the weeks of grief to come. Thank you. student when I read Cowboys Are My Weakness, and uh, I've been running after Pam Houston all my life, so it's such a thrill to sit on stage with her, so thank you so much for coming and talking to me. Thank you for talking to me. So let's talk about this memoir. Um, I, um, I wanted to know why you decided to write this book now, because it seems to span so much. It's got the natural world, it has mothers, it has the ranch, it has home, there's so much in it. And I just wondered, like, did lightning strike you and say, write this book? What happened? No, not at all. Um, in fact, more so than any of my other books, this book was my publisher's idea. Oh. Um, my publisher had said to me, 
I want you to go on a book length adventure. And I, and I, and basically my publisher has published everything that I've dreamed mm -hmm. up over the last 30 years. Right. And so I thought, okay, I can do that. And so I made a list of book length adventures, like mushing dogs to the North Pole or sailing the whole coast of Turkey. Cause I thought I'm an adventuring type and <laughs> it would be fun to go on a book length adventure paid for by a publisher. Like that seems like the kind of thing that I say yes to. Um, and then I was driving home from a teaching quarter at Davis and the dogs were in the car and we drive across Highway 50 and kind of to get excited about coming home, we take lots of walks on the Forest Service roads on in Nevada and Utah. And we were up on one of those Forest Service roads and the dogs were so happy to be on the leashless side of the Sierras. And, um, you know, everybody was excited. They knew what it meant. and. I just thought to myself, oh wait, I'm already having my book length adventure. Mm -hmm. um, my book length adventure began 26 years ago when I bought this ranch for 5% down and a signed hardcover copy of Cowboys Are My Weakness, and, and which is literally true. And, um, and it has been, you know, it has gone from the thing I always had to figure out how to pay the mortgage on to the story of my life. And so I wrote that as a proposal and said, you know, I'm, I'm having my book length adventure. It started 26 years ago, or at that time, 20 years ago. It actually seems like the biggest adventure you've been on in mm. some ways. Mm. It, um, you, s you call it the, uh, you, we, um, the adrenaline rush of buying. And um, so I, I want to, I guess we're going to talk about this a little bit more about the kind of what the adventure is, but can you say a little bit more about that? I mean, you, you're legendary for doing great big things in your life. And how can you translate the adventure to the ranch? Well, um, you know, I, I the, the summer that I bought the ranch, I had dropped out of grad school. <laughs> um, I dropped out of grad school with two months left because my book, Cowboys Are My Weakness, had come out mm -hmm. and they started to treat me very badly there. They said that I glorified an archaic form of masculinity and that I had set feminism back 50 years <laughs> by myself. Boo. Can you imagine <laughs> the power <laughs> that they afforded me? Um, um, and, and just one day I was in the English department office and, uh, you know, I was in a five-year program. I was two months from my PhD right. and, and there were two professors of mine standing at the copy machine talking about whether it was better to be an imminent writer or an eminent writer. And English um, departments. <laughs> this was this was a professor who had said on our first day of workshop, no snow, no mountains, no trees, no skis, no eyes, and no female bodily excretions. Those were the um, rules for a workshop. And then I wrote Cowboys Are My Weakness, which if you happen to read it, you understand is an aria to all of those things. Um, <laughs> but, but anyway, so there they were saying eminent, 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 eminent. Didn't have anything to do with me. But I looked across the English department office and I thought, what if I never had to go back in this building? What if I never had to go back in this building? And once I started saying it, it took on a kind of a chant quality in my head. And I never went back in the building. I didn't go back to get my coat. I didn't go back to get my, oh my books. God. I literally, literally never went back in this building, have not <laughs> been back in the building to this day. So I was set free. I had a check for $21,000. I no longer had a place to live. I was living in my yellow uh, Toyota Corolla. Which one of my students wrote a haiku yes, for? Yes, <laughs> it's the first haiku. <laughs> um, uh, my, my lemon yellow and my North Face VE24 tent, which also happened to be yellow. And I had my dog, uh, Jackson, who was a a sheepdog Airedale cross precursor to the wolfhound look. If you can picture a sheepdog Airedale and their fuzzy faces, that's, he made me fall in love, I think, with wolfhounds, but that's another story. Anyway, um, um, so, so my agent, when she gave me the check for $21,000, which is how much I got paid for cowboys, she said, don't spend it all on hiking boots, because mm -hmm. she knew me and knew my tendencies. And so 
I drove around the country giving readings at small independent bookstores. Thank you, small independent yeah. bookstore, for coming tonight. Yeah. Um, this is another aside, but I'm just going to take it. I've been in small independent bookstores all year since the book came out, and I got to tell you, that's where it's happening. That's really uh, cool. Libraries, honestly, and small independent bookstores are where people are talking, and people are having the hard conversations, and people are trying to figure yeah. out how we're going to get through this mess we've gotten ourselves in. And and really, I mean, small independent bookstores have never been more alive than they are right now, after almost having no. died, you know? Capitalism tried to kill them, and capitalism lost, and small independent bookstores won, and it's, a, it's really a miracle. Um, but anyway, so that summer, way back when, 1993, I drove around the West um, giving readings and looking for a place to put that $21,000. And so when I got to Creed, and um, one thing led to another, and I was shown this piece of property, which was 120 acres, and the most beautiful place I'd ever seen, and the 100-year-old barn, and it was the third week of September, so I don't have to tell you what was happening on the mountainsides. Um, I just fell completely in love with it. My $21,000 represented 5% down of the asking price. <laughs> And for that reason, it was an adventure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it was Answer. an adrenaline-producing <laughs> adventure. The, the realtor said to me, Donna Blair, who was the widow who was selling the ranch, she said, Donna Blair's going to like the idea of you. So give me that $21,000 and a signed hardcover copy of Cowboys Are My Weakness, and I'll see what I can do. This is the great thing about small towns. It is yeah, the great absolutely. thing about small towns. Yeah. And she agreed to sell me the ranch, and she agreed to, to carry the note herself, even though I didn't have a job, and I was a recent grad school dropout, and I was living in my car. Um, <laughs> so for all those reasons, it was an adrenaline-producing adventure. And, but also, it's important to say that once she expressed that belief in me, even though she was a total stranger to me, it would have seemed terrible to say no. It would have seemed like I was turning around and trying to swim right upstream, like everything in the mm -hmm. world was funneling me toward that ranch, and there was really no way to say no, or at least that's how it seemed. Not that I wanted to. I mean, I fell in love with it, but I didn't seriously consider not doing it, even though it was a crazy thing to do, given my life circumstances, and given how much I didn't know about ranching. I mean, just for one thing, you know, as ill-equipped as I was to pay for it, <coughs> I was more ill-equipped to care for it. I come from New Jersey <laughs> and deep in suburbia. And, you know, you turn the hot water faucet on and the hot water comes out of the wall miraculously. You know, I, I didn't know. I knew almost nothing. And you've lived. You, the house is not burned down, and you know the everything. Have. Everything has survived, so that's fantastic. Congratulations! Yeah, I did. I learned. The learning curve was steep. So I want to talk a little bit because you're uh, you started out as a fiction writer, and uh, and and you've written essays and have a collection. Um, a little more about me, and but memoir is a different animal. Oh my goodness! And um, for me, memoir is a journey. Mm -hmm. And I have a little something I want you to read, and then we'll talk about it. Okay. Uh, it's a, you want to use your book or my book? No, your book. Okay, I've got to find it. Okay. Of course, you know, you'd think I would mark the page, but I did not do that. Today I hit all my mar I had this book I've been carrying around with me for weeks, and it had, you know, three dozen sticky, yellow stickies. Okay, there it is. So from here to there. Okay. <coughs> This book has taken me nearly five years to write, a long time, even by my own molasses standards. When I started, I was attempting to express my love for a piece of land that has defined the largest portion by far of my life. Somewhere along the way, I came to understand that to write a book about my little parcel of take your breath beauty, sitting up here as it does in one of the last valleys in North America that will go underwater when the oceans start to rise in earnest. 
to write a book about loving this particular pristine acreage when so many millions of acres are being destroyed at an unprecedented rate would be a kind of heresy. Somewhere in the process, I started writing toward an answer to the question I wake up with every morning and go to bed with every night. How do I find hope on a dying planet? And if there is no hope to be found, how do I live in its absence? In what state of being? Respect, tenderness, unmitigated love, the rich and sometimes deeply clarifying dreamscape of vast, inconsolable grief. In her book, Hope in the Dark, Rebecca Solnit calls for us to redefine hope as an accounting of complexities and uncertainties with openings. Is there an opening before us big enough to save the planet? And if so, is there an opening big enough to save the planet that does not necessitate the annihilation of us? E.O. Wilson says we could take the earth all the way down to the microbes and she would still find a way to recover. Even now, evidence of the earth's ability to heal herself is all around us, a daily astonishment. Every day the Everglades purify stream water by filtering out agricultural toxins. Mycelia mushrooms filter radioactivity from the ground around Chernobyl. Earthworms are still cleaning all that DDT we put in the soil in decades past. We won't know until the ninth inning what she'll do in her last at bat. This book has been an effort to write my way to an understanding of how to be alive in the meantime. In the final days, if not of the earth, then at least of the earth as I've known her. Because it has only been in knowing her that I've come to know myself. Thank you. So what's the journey of the book? I mean, you're talking mm. about that. So what is the journey? I mean, what was the revelation for you in writing this book? Yeah, well, the first thing to say is to acknowledge what you've said about memoir. Like, I thought, I've written all these personal essays. Memoir will be a breeze. <laughs> that was funny. That was a funny thought. Um, um, memoir, I teach memoir. I taught it before I wrote this, which is now strikes me as an absurdity. I mean, m memoir is is in fiction, when you're writing fiction and you're bored, you can blow up a car or you can have a handsome Don't, Italian walk My students are up there, in. do not say that. <laughs> you can, you, you can have an, a handsome Italian walk in and deliver a line, you right. know. Um, you can have a moose run through, run up your driveway. Like in fiction, even if it's autobiographical, which mine is, um, there's always that option to get out of your boredom by making something happen. And so it's a very, I, I came to think of it compared to memoir as like a very vertical process. It pops up and it dives down. Um, memoir is like, it's like water flowing out across a field and sinking in, you know, it's, it's saturation. And you just have to sit there while it saturates and hope that meaning arises, you know? And it's hard to sit there because in those bored places, that's where all the self-hatred, you know, comes in and like, why, you know, why would anyone care about this? So all those naysaying voices in the writer's head, like boredom is the enemy of them, but there's no choice in memoir but to just sit there. I felt like when I was writing this, I felt like I was a calf, like standing in the middle of a field like staring with my mouth open, you know? And I felt, I imagined the reader looking at this calf, you know, just <laughs> like with my tongue out. I did, like I felt so dumb when I was writing this book and so plain and so unadorned in a way that fiction isn't, you know? Um, the, the process with the book was my agent, my editor, me, when we started talking about this, which we talked more at before it was ever written than I ever had with a book. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was like all ranch all the time. That's what it was gonna be. It was gonna be a year in Provence in Colorado, we called it, among <laughs> ourselves. Um, and it was gonna be, you know, like baling hay and birthing lambs and chopping wood and the return of the bluebirds and the Perseid meteor showers, which, which it is, all, it, it is all those things. 
But I wrote that book and we all hated it. You know, it just wasn't a book yet, you know, to your point. And um, I, that's what I'm sort of addressing in that passage. And it was my agent who said, isn't this the book where you really talk about what happened to you as a child? Mm. Which I hadn't at all in this book. But what I said to her when she said that was, well, that's all I've done my whole career is talk about what happened to me as a child. And she's like, nope, no, you haven't. <laughs> and I was like, oh. And she said, she said, no, you haven't talked about it in this plain spoken way like you're talking about chopping wood or baling hay. And and that was true. And you're not hiding behind fiction anymore. Right. Yeah. I had always couched it in fiction or right. metaphor or dream or whatever. And it wasn't because I was hiding exactly that same teacher who said no female bodily excretions. He said, you can't swing a dead cat anymore without hitting an abuse story. And for well, all alas, it's alas. true, but <laughs> it, there's a reason for that. And for all the things he he said, like, for some reason I internalized that, like, most stuff I was able to push back against him, which is really what graduate school is, you know. I tell my students <laughs> that all the time. This is about finding out the kind of writer you don't want to be. Um, um, but, but in any case, so I just really didn't want to be boring, you know. Uh, but anyway, that's, uh, we're getting, that's too cycle. I, in any case, um, so... So I wrote, uh, so, I, so I added the chapters about my childhood, um, the chapters that, that negotiate between the ranch and my childhood. And of course she was right, you know, the ranch has a lot more meaning if, um, if it's the healing place, if it's the safe place, um, compared to this childhood that was, uh, the, the quickest way to say it, if you haven't read the book, is um, my, both my parents drank a ton. Um, and my dad was violent. He broke my femur when I was four. So I spent my fourth year in a three-quarter body cast. And then there was a lot of other sorts of abuses, including sexual uh, in my junior high and early high school years. Um, so, and my mom was sort of too drunk to deal. But so I, so I, I put that in the book from this side. And then as I just read about, you know, I over the last eight years, which is really how long it's been now since I started writing it, you know, the, the climate catastrophe has become more and more and more present to all of us, but to me. And so it's kind of like my childhood came from this side, the climate catastrophe came from this side, they met over the scaffolding of the ranch, which was very tactile, you know, mm -hmm. bale and hay, chopping wood. And, and I came to understand, you know, if you're lucky, you write a book and it will really show you something. And what this book really showed me is that my response to my childhood, the way I look at that now as an adult is like this two-handed, you know, I, I, I grieve for that girl. She was terrified. She thought her father was gonna kill her every day. I have all this sadness about it. But also, also it, it got me here <laughs> to this <laughs> life that I love so much. And there were people yes, that I write about that. along the way that got me out of my house and into the world, um, the most, uh, the earliest and the most steadfast, this woman named Martha Washington, who was sort of a glorified babysitter who, who taught me right from wrong. So, so I have all this you know, affection for her and all this joy about having m survived my father's house and made it to this life that I love so much. And, and those two ways of thinking about a thing together, the grief and the joy, is, you know, exactly what the world's asking me of me right now, vis-a-vis -vis climate change. Like, I gotta love the world every minute, and I've gotta grieve it, too. And I can't pretend that it's not dying, but it's still beautiful, and that's cause for celebration, and those two things side by side. I mean, I know that some of you are out there going, yeah, this is like adulthood 101, you know, good for you, Pam, for like getting there at age 57. But, but you know, I wasn't, I wasn't raised by sane people, so, so it takes me a while to get to these things, you know? And so, so that's where I got. That's what the book showed me, this, like, of course, that's what the world is asking of us, is to, is to hold the grief and the joy and the wonder side by side. And, and it's really interesting because part of that thread that, uh, that connects those two 
things as, as mothers. Mm. So your mother, Martha. there's Martha Washington, mm. there's, um, but then, but your mother died right before you bought the ranch, is that right? Yes. And Terry Tempest Williams says to you, now you're untethered. Right. And you say, I, I'm, I, now I bought the ranch and it was my way to retether to like, so I want you to talk about that, but I want to talk about that idea. Well, let's talk about that first, then I got another question about mothers. Well, yeah, I mean, oh, yeah. I, my mother and I, my mother was a beautiful, talented alcoholic and, um, and we were very close in certain ways, but she didn't mother me per se, you know, she was smart and funny and gorgeous. Um, she, Martha Washington, who became my lighthouse for my young life, my mother was in the hospital having just given birth to me and she wanted to go to a party from the hospital and she went to a bulletin board and there was Martha Washington's name oh on the bulletin board for babysitting at the obstetrics ward, right? And she called her and... I mean, it's a miracle. I mean, it is. It's a miracle. Trust me. Um, and Martha Washington came to the hospital to watch me so my mother could leave the hospital and go to a party. I mean, she, was, she had chutzpah, my mother. I'll say that for her. Um, and Martha fell in love with me, like, instantly, and then sort of dedicated her, the rest of her life to me. I mean, really, to my safety and my care and to teaching me how to swim and teaching me how to read when I was two and a half and wow. teaching me how to hold doors for my elders and teaching me that like gratitude is the right response to almost everything. And I, I would have never had any of that, mm -hmm. you know? She was in her 60s um, when I met her, so I was her late in life project. And um, she died when I was 20. And you know, every good thing about me comes from that, but, but, <sighs> After my dad broke my leg, she tried to take me from my parents and that turned into a thing. And so we moved to Pennsylvania, we moved away from Martha. And I still got to see her a lot, but not as much. And it was really when we moved to Pennsylvania that I turned to, to the outside, to the, to the outside world and long walks in the woods and you know, understanding that I could be mothered um, by Mother Earth, Mother Nature. and. Um, and, and I take that so literally that now, even now, at my age, when I'm very sad, I will go outside and I will like curl up in the roots of a tree. Or I will, you know, build a little snow cave and get in the snow cave. Or I will um, always, you know, take a walk and look at the beauty and all that. But I, when I'm really sad, <laughs> I will... I will become a child with the earth wrapped around me. I will find that position. And, you know, it's one of those things that I only realized really quite recently that not everybody does. <laughs> like, I just thought it was a thing people do. Because <laughs> I do it. I'm, I'm just going to read this to you because um, you say this in the book. Uh, when you give yourself wholly to a piece of ground, its goodness enters your bloodstream like an infusion. You will never be alone in the same way again, never quite dislocated. Your heart will grow into and back out of that ground like a tree. Mm. That's beautiful. I love that. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about, um, I want to talk about, I mean, I've got these kind of, I, you guys are going to ask about the ranch, I'm pretty sure. But I want to talk about home, the concept of home. And I, I completely identify with this idea of not feeling like there's a place for me and what does home mean? And I'm just wondering how your concept of home, what is your concept of home and how has it changed? One of my students said, I wonder if it's different because she's not at the ranch 365 mm -hmm. days out of the year. And so I just want to talk about how has your concept of home changed since you've moved, you've been on the ranch? <sighs> That's a complicated question, mm -hmm. especially right now, um, because I have great fear for this country. And I have great fear that we will not be free in this country for very much longer. And I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave the ranch and move to another country. <laughs> and so honestly, like I'm hedging my bets about how committed I am to it right now because I'm so frightened. Um, but prior to the current 
goings on in Washington. I would say um, that um, the, um, you know, driving around that last bend to the ranch, the last bend of the Rio Grande, and there I can see it, like, it's a feeling like I, I've never had, you know, anywhere in my life, the feeling of like, whoo, my whole body relaxes, you know, my whole body relaxes. And, and, and maybe if I lived there 300, just to answer your student's question, maybe if I were there 365 days a year, maybe I would be cranky about it. Or maybe mm -hmm. I would be like, God, I want sushi. Or maybe I would be yeah. like, um, my neighbors, you know, uh, drive too fast. Like, I don't know. I don't know what people say about their neighbors. For me, um, the fact that it's always the place I'm trying to get back to just makes it so valuable. Yeah. You know, um, I can't make my living there. And, and also, teaching is so important to me. It has become, I mean, I, when you asked about home, I thought, wow, you know, there's something homish <laughs> about my, about mentoring and being with students mm. like that's a kind of home in my life um, that if I lost the ranch or if I had to give it up I would I would make a home in my in my role of mentoring with certain students I have such amazing students and they're publishing amazing books and and so many so much w of what's good in my life right now is mentoring these books into the world that we need so badly you know these books of these young writers and not such young writers, um, uh, new writers. And so, um, but, but the fact that I have to leave to, to work, and, be, and I like to leave, I do. I like sushi a lot, you know? And I like really good coffee, and I like film, and I like, um, I even like dry cleaning, you know? Like, I, th like there's things that I, c like I, I think, oh, I get to dry clean my blazer next week. I've thought that today several times. <laughs> With enthusiasm, um, um, there's so many things at the ranch, you know, that that we that are so profoundly healing. But I'm not a loner, and I'm not a meat and potatoes person. <laughs> and I, you know, there's many wonderful things about coming to the city and and talking with people who read, and you know, and eating. Um, Indian food, you know, like there's, I, I like it both ways. I have it both ways and I like it both ways. And, and as a result of me having to be gone from the ranch so much, going home always feels good. Do you think that home though then in that case can just be saying that you're more at home in who you are now? Because it really mm. feels like this book, I mean, Pam, I've read everything you've written. <laughs> And I, I mean, this book feels like a revelation to me. It feels mm -hmm. like you have come to something. I mean, I really, I, I mean, I know that you're writing fiction about your life and that kind of stuff, but I just really feel like you went in there and you said, here it is. And I just feel like you kind of settled in. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm totally projecting. No, I don't I, know. I think that's right. I mean, I think I, um, I mean, you know, uh, uh, you know this. I, I assume you know this. I don't know how old you are exactly. I'm close. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this amazing thing happens to women when yeah. they turn 50. You know, yeah. I feel so sorry for women who don't make it to 50. Yeah. Because 50 is such a miracle. Yeah. Because you stop caring what other people think of you. And it's a oh, miracle. Oh, I never cared. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I never yeah, cared. Yeah, well, you yeah. didn't. You know, <laughs> it's a miracle. And you just say what you think. And the filters come off, and and you're not worried about, you know, oh, did I hurt his feelings, or, or do I look all right, right. Or, you know, all that stuff. Like a, a bunch of it fell away at 40, but then the whole rest of the show just <laughs> dropped off at 50, and and so a lot of it's just that. Yeah. But it's but it's also that the ranch taught me, you know, the ranch taught me I could be responsible. I mean, I paid off the ranch during the West Fork fire, um, there's a big chapter in here called Diary of a Fire. And, uh, and I made my final payment um, really on a day that we didn't know whether the ranch was gonna burn down or not. And I thought, if I hand her this check, is that gonna make the ranch more likely to burn down or not, or less likely? But, um, but you know, I, 
I did this crazy adrenaline producing thing of buying the ranch and then I paid for it and I paid for every bit of it with money I earned from my teaching and my writing and and there's something in that that calms me down and makes me feel like I did right by it you know I I learned I failed I tried harder I figured out how to give a animal a shot in the middle of the night when the roads aren't plowed I sweep my own chimney I learned all about fencing and you know UV protector and plumbing I, I can fix a cell phone with a steak knife now and <laughs> um, I did I took my own cell phone apart with a steak knife and I fixed it I, but but I um, you know I, I think I think the combination of 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 paying for the ranch, of putting it into a, a conservation easement, which I did. I think, I think for the the last 25 years, I've had you know I, I did this to myself, but I've had this like oh I'm gonna let it down, I'm gonna fail it, I'm gonna lose it, it's gonna be subdivided, like all these crazy thoughts in my head, like it was my responsibility, and now, and now it's in a conservation easement. So as long as there's you know, a country and a Colorado. Um, we're worried about that. But as long as those things hold, you know, it will be protected. So ultimately, I did right by it, even though I maybe had no business doing it. I mean, it's like in your book, you yeah. know? It's so much like in your book where you say, oh, I deserve to have the fire. It's that same oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. impulse. Yeah. And and I was thinking about that today, how much that's like, because I was like, I'm going to lose the ranch, I'm going to hurt the ranch, I'm going to burn the ranch down. And, and I didn't, you know, I didn't. I, I showed up, and, um, and, I, I, and I'm proud of that. Well, you should be. I think you, so we need to talk about being the cowboy, because I think the thing about it is that we're really close in age, and I think a lot of uh, women in particular in this audience, when I t do book stuff, women come up to me and talk to me about the kind of life I've lived, and they're, I wish I could do that, they say. And so I want to talk, I want you to talk about being the cowboy, but also the kinds of ideas that women grow up with, and, and where do we go from here? Because you know what, sisters, it's us right now. This is it. It's us. So. Uh, yeah, well, the, the, the easiest way to talk about that is to say, when I wrote Cowboys Are My Weakness, when I came out here from New Jersey and fell in love with this landscape, and this landscape in particular, you know, Colorado in particular, um, not just the Rocky Mountains, not just the West. Everyone always says, you live in Montana, don't you? I was like, no, <laughs> I've never lived in Montana. I live in Colorado. Um, you know, I, because I, I was dating hunting guides and river guides and becoming a hunting guide and a river guide myself, but always like behind the man, always, I, I thought that um, in my own naive way, I think I thought that I needed a man to translate this landscape for me, that if I could get close to the man, the cowboy, hence the title, not real cowboys exactly, but you know, um, I could get proximity to this landscape and that they were the translators. And this book very much, like I wrote my way to that sentence where I say I finally realized I could be the cowboy. Um, you know, I, I, I wrote my way to that sentence um, in good faith, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I, I, I didn't know that sentence and tried to, I got to it and I was like, oh, that happened, you know? And, and I do think, you know, owning the ranch and caring for it uh, was the best way to have proximity, to, to understand that I have a relationship with this land. I have a relationship with these trails. A, a woman, a, a student of mine came to me crying because her, her husband has passed away a few years ago, but she was like, I'm so afraid to go out and hike, you know, mm. without him. And I said, well, I'll go with you. Like, call me. <laughs> like, we'll go together. Um, because I've always gone out by right. myself. I always was I always the cowboy. I just didn't see I it didn't until see I it. wrote this book. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have the same experience. Somebody talked, so a friend of mine got divorced and she said, I don't know how to mow the lawn. And I was like, yeah. 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 So what do we do? What do we do? I mean, I really feel like, and this is one of the things I've been talking about. I have this little spiel called Marlboro Woman where I say, you know, 
it, you know, when I wrote my book, people said, oh my God, weren't you afraid living by yourself? Oh my God, weren't you lonely? And, and I wrote the book in answer to those questions. And I, and I feel like women need to be not only reading stories of women who are doing it on their own, but they need to be getting out there and, and experiencing their own strength and their own independence, because I do really think that women are the future. You know, I, I teach a lot, as I said, and I teach both men and women, but, I, but the largest group of people I teach are women of all ages. Um, I have house sitters that come to my ranch and take care of things while I'm gone. They're almost always young women. Um, and when I get in a room with, with women of any age um, who have stories to tell and who want to tell their stories, um, it, it's, it's so powerful. And, and what I don't understand and what I want the way I want to help in the next year is whatever it is we're moving into right now. I want to help women know their own power, you know, because everywhere I look, I see young women, older women, post 50 year old women who have more power in their little fingers yeah. than these frightened, lying men. Yeah. Um, who, who, who are selling us out. Yeah. And, and I just, like, I know, I know the patriarchy, I know the media, I know all the things that are amassed against us, but if women can just keep reaffirming, if we can just re keep reaffirming each other's, you know, not just power, but ability to help. Do you remember when Christine Blasey Ford kept saying in the hearing, I just want to help. I just want to help. And that's the thing, you know, we, we can help and, and we just have to keep telling each other, you know, I see you, I see, I mean, that's the thing I say more than anything I say now. I say it constantly. I say, I see you, I, I see your power. I can see it. And you know, it's not power to destroy or overtake. It's power to help. It's power to build, you know, beautiful, things that will help as we, and even if we got rid of all the, the, the uh, current, <laughs> the, 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 the current administration, even if we got rid of all that, you know, we, we're still facing a catastrophe yes. and, and we need compassion and we need ideas and we need to help. There's so many young people with good ideas. We need to empower them, you know, the young farmers and these young scientists who are coming up with you know, all these things to pull carbon out of the air, all these things. But, but unfortunately, we have, you know, women keep being told to shut up. And right. they're being told to shut up so much right now, we're almost not noticing how much they're being told to shut up. And that can't stand. Can't stand. I have no idea how much time we have left. <laughs> Hello, Justin. Justin. Oh, good. I have. Oh, great. I have a great. Um, so I just want to. Terrific. I have a. Um, you know, you. The largest part of this book is Diary of a Fire. Mm -hmm. um, so my house burned down, so I know what this is like. Um, but I was thinking. I'm just going to float this idea because it's. You render this fire in incredible detail, and you're using stuff from NC Web, and you've got your defining terms and. It's, it's huge, it's like, it's like the Moby Dick of fires. <laughs> and um, I, I was just thinking about this, like why did she do that? What's going on there, what's going on there? And you say at the end, I, I now know so much about fires that I will never be afraid of fire in the same way. And then I thought, oh my God, that fire is like a metaphor for climate change. Mm. That we're, that, you know, we start, if we, we ha what we have to do, and I know all of us think this, we hear bad news and we go, right? And we have to keep our eyes open. And I think that's one of the things that your book does really well is to encourage us to kind of love and grieve and to keep our eyes open mm -hmm. and get ready. Yeah. So. I mean, for me, you know, knowledge has always been power. You know, for me, if like there's a funny noise in the plane, like I'm the one who pushes my call button and say, I want to know what that noise is. Can you please <laughs> tell me what that noise is? Um, like, I like to have information. And one of the reasons that 
the fire chapter isn't the largest part of the book. It's just the longest chapter. Right. But, and it was a big fight with my publisher because they all live in New York, you know, where it's raining, right. probably right now. Yeah. And they were like, nobody cares about fire. And I was like, you know, and, and it, was, it, it was interesting because everyone on the East Coast was like, the fire chapter's too long. And everyone on the West Coast was like, I couldn't put down the fire chapter, you know, in the West. <laughs> and it really was like, it was a Mississippi River debate. Yeah. Um, but, but we live with it now. Um, you know, we live with fire now, as I know you all know. Um, and for me, going through the West Fork fire and being the most obsessive NC web watcher, I know there are other people in this room who think, no, I was more obsessive than you. But in fact, I was the most obsessive NC web watcher there has ever been. Um, and I would cross-reference the various sites, and I would look up the glossary of wildland fire terms. And I wanted the chapter to reflect that, um, so much about that. But also, you know, it, this is about language, and this is about, like, I learned the language of fire. Mm -hmm. And as a writer and someone who loves the natural world, like, I learned the language of river rafting. I learned the language of Western geology. I learned the language of sheep hunting when I was a guide. I learned the language of, you know, the Colorado Plateau. Like, it's an honoring to mm -hmm. learn the language of something. Yes. And I wanted to honor fire <laughs> and firefighters and firefighting, you know, with that chapter of, like once we can speak the language, a thing doesn't become so scary anymore, and um, and that's really the 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 arc of that long essay. It's like I'll never be scared in the same way again because now I understand that aspen trees have water in their trunks. Now I understand what um, you know what if uh, 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 what's it called? No, I can't think of what it's called. The funny word. What's the funny firefighting tool? A Pulaski, yeah. Now I, exactly, thank you. Now I know what a Pulaski, look at all the firefighters. <laughs> now I know what a Pulaski is. You know, there's, there's something about, um, and I mean, I know you know this because I've been listening to your book all day, but, but like knowing the language of the place you are yeah. that, um, that, that sinks you into it yeah. and makes it home, you know, back to that. Like I am more at home in fire danger times because I speak the language of fire now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we're going to have some questions. So if you have a question for Pam, if you would raise your hand and we have people who are coming around with microphones and I'm going to point. Oh, come on. I didn't ask one animal question. She's got some great stories. <laughs> yeah, right. No, no. Please wait for the microphone. Oh, I... Hi. Hi. I was just wondering about your writing practice. Could you talk about that? Yeah. Um, I don't... I wish I could say I had a practice. <laughs> um, I wish I could answer this question that some way that sounds more like a grown up. But, um, you know, I, I don't write every day and I don't write every week and I don't write every month. Um, that's the truth. I avoid writing whenever possible. Um, uh, I just heard Ocean Vong talk the other night in San Francisco and he said, he said, I loathe writing, but I love seeing. And that's the thing. I love to collect stuff to write about. I just don't like the writing part. Um, but the truth is, I, I teach so much. I have 10 master degree thesis students this spring alone. So I will be reading probably 5,000 pages of student work. So I really do prioritize my students these days. I, I realize that's not what you asked me. Um, I write in between. I write when a flight gets canceled. I write when I'm home at the ranch for a couple weeks. I'll go out there to my little cabin and see what happens. Um, I write when I have something due. 
Sometimes I, I, I get things due on purpose because it will make me write. Um, I'm writing short stories right now and I'm really enjoying that, but when I say I'm writing short stories right now, I haven't touched a short story since the week after New Year's. So I, I don't have a practice. I, I wish I did. I wish I could say what I hear so many people say. I set the alarm for five and it goes up and then I make my coffee and then I write for two hours straight and then I get to go take the dogs for a walk. It's not my life. And I, I think maybe that's okay. I think maybe writing isn't meant to be on a clock or on a schedule, at least not for some writers. Um, I said a long time ago that I didn't really care whether I wrote two books or six books or 10 books, as long as I was really engaged in the book I was writing and I was engaged in the world alongside the book I was writing. And, and that's kind of turned out to be true. It kind of amazes me that I've written six books because I'm so bad at staying in the chair. But once I get on a roll, then I might stay in longer. Like I might really carve out, like once I feel like, a, like something's happening, like I've got a book coming together, then I might block out time if I can to really write. And then sometimes I'll write for 17 hours in a row, you know, if it's rolling. But that only happens, you know, a couple times a year. So I, I yeah, again, I know this isn't the right answer, but it's, it's the true answer. <laughs> Other questions? Over here. Um, I, I just want to address your, your graduate school experience um, and writing teachers and why do you think they're so prescriptive? Well, not all of them. I mean, why is there such a, a propensity to be prescriptive? And, and is there any room for prescription in, in you know, the writing classroom? I mean, is it all evil? <laughs> oh, no. I mean, I teach, at, I teach at two universities and I started my own nonprofit where we teach all the time. I mean, there's wonderful, wonderful writing teachers. I hire them for writing by writers all the time. Um, you know, I went to school at a particular moment in a particular program. Um, and, uh, you know, lots of writers came out of that program. I learned a ton there. I should say that. I learned a ton at Utah. I went to Utah. I, it's, it's not a secret. But I, 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 I learned a ton there. Um, they just didn't like my work, you know? Um, but that's okay. Uh, what I, I can't talk about what other teachers do, but, but what I do when I read student work is what I'm trying to do, and this is really important to me, this answer, I'm trying really hard to see what that story or novel or memoir wants to be. That's, I always read everything twice. I sat in the car, I don't know if people saw me, I was sitting in my car on my computer because I had promised to get the story back. So I was sitting out there for an hour because I didn't know how long it would take me to get down here in the snow. And I was like rereading the student story for the second time because she's in a, a touchy place, you know, emotionally and I just wanted to make sure that I could really get in there and see the story and then I made all my notes and saved it, you know, and then I came in here to do this. Like, um, I, my first job is to see what the story wants to be and then think about how I might help it get there. But my bigger job is to just hold a place for that person to tell their story and maybe to put books in their hand that'll help them. So, so that's what I do as a teacher. But, but I know many wonderful teachers. I work with a woman in Davis, Katie Peterson. She's a poet. She's an amazing teacher. I mean, there's, a, there's many amazing writing teachers. There's also some really shitty ones. <laughs> Other questions? Over here. In the, out there in the edge. Hi. Um, I was wondering if in the future, you just, you just spoke about writing again, and I know you're, you're knee deep in being a great educator. I'm kind of curious if you're going to put your um, Icelandic adventures in any uh -huh. fiction coming up, uh, or or essays, like maybe being the the Western um, woman that's gone to a different country and being the outsider again, and how that makes you to feel come back, how that makes you to feel to come back home when you mm. when you leave the country to such a different place. Mm. I loved Iceland. I went to Iceland this summer, and it was so much fun. It, it it's such a beautiful landscape. 
everywhere you turn. Um, I don't know if I'll write about Iceland. I think I probably will. I already wrote one little tiny piece about being in Iceland. It was for an anthology called Letter to a Stranger. And I wrote about seeing this woman who was riding her Icelandic horse, bringing the sheep down for what they call the retir, which is when they collect all the sheep in the fall. So I already have a little Icelandic piece, but it was, like I said, it was very short. Um, I imagine Iceland will crop up. Uh, my experiences there will crop up in things as I write forward. Um, and that piece was really fun to write. Um, in fact, it's my favorite thing I've written this fall. It's, it's only like 500 words long, but I really, I got into her, that woman. Uh, I mean, of course, not for real. <laughs> I, I got into my imagined version of her. Um, but anyway, uh, I, I imagine Iceland will work its way in to things I write. Over here, I keep hitting this side because I'm aimed that way, but anybody over here? Questions? Did you have one in the orange sweater? Yeah, right here. Yeah. We're reporting. We're recording for podcast and live streaming, so we wait need to, you to wait for the microphone. You have a new cabin. I do. And it was described so beautifully in your last book. Yes, thank you. So you're getting used to that now, but have you lost anything about uh, the original? condition of that that is part of the old cabin um, I'll tell you what happened you might find this interesting so so uh, there was a cabin on my property um, for those of you who don't know there was a cabin on my property that was the homesteaders cabin the homesteaders son lived in it for about 60 years and when I took over the property it was in pretty bad disarray and then over the 25 years I've owned the property, it started to split, like the ground sort of rose up under it and it was gonna split like a cupcake. And I had left it alone because I thought that's Bob's, like the spirit of Bob who lived in it for 65 years, that's his spot and I don't need to mess with his spot. But then it was gonna fall down if I didn't fix it. So with some trepidation, I, I found a guy, a local guy, RJ Mann, who loves the old cabins and loves to preserve them, and he fixed it. <laughs> he made it a writing space for me. And I have a, a good friend named Seth Browder who um, actually communicates with the dead. Um, and the dead make himself so known to him, he can hardly go outside some days. And I have seen him do this. Like, I, I don't have a strong belief system around this. But I have seen Seth, like, tell friends of mine amazing things about their dead relatives that he could no way know, you know. Anyway, so I believe in Seth. I guess that's the way to say it. I don't know if I believe in that the dead are floating around, but I believe in Seth's ability to communicate with them. And so I asked Seth... Seth sees Bob all the time, my homesteader, and they smoke together And every time Seth comes to the ranch. So I asked Seth, like, how was Bob about the cabin? Because in truth, I had made it a little girly. Like, I have a red pellet stove. That's my version of girly, but there you have it. And so I put a red pellet stove in it, and I thought, oh, Bob would hate that. <laughs> Bob would hate the red pellet stove. M mostly it's still his cabin. I mean, all the same wood is used. It's just used a little differently. Like, we really preserved it. But we raised the roof so that I could actually stand up in it because he was very short. And, and we put the red pellet stove in. And, um, and what Seth said to me about Bob, he said, you know, he sees it the old way, Aww. which I thought was so beautiful. Nice. There was right here. Um, I was just wondering uh, what, you know, given that you came from New Jersey, mm -hmm. uh, was there an activity that turned you towards nature when you were young? And, and is that activity still something that you find yourself coming back to kind of over and over again? Yeah. Um, I mean, lots of things, but the main thing is 
there was this guy in our neighborhood. It was actually Pennsylvania by that time because we moved to Pennsylvania when I was four. But same difference, really, you know, eastern Pennsylvania. Um, there was a guy in our neighborhood named Colonel Bob Miller, and he was a retired Army guy, and he took all the kids camping, and we, we had to ride under wool blankets <laughs> in the back of station wagons, and he would tell us we were going out west. And, you know, it was 100 degrees in a Pennsylvania summer, and so we believed him because we were, like, under these wool blankets <laughs> in the back of station wagons. And he would be like, oh, we just crossed the Mississippi. And then he'd be like, oh, we just crossed the wide Missouri. And then he would, um, you know, get permission. He would stop and get permission from the, the Indian chief, <laughs> excuse me for that, um, to uh, enter the reservation. You know, so all this time. And if you looked out from under the blanket, you got demoted because we had <laughs> ranks. We, like, we started out as buck privates, and then we advanced to corporal and sergeant and chief petty officer, all of those. And, um, and, he, and really, we were going to just really a, a city park in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. <laughs> um, and we, we camped out, and we had, uh, you know, we took hikes in the, in the, in the very small woods. And we play. We had night watches. Y you had to stay up between like like the dead man's watch was three to four, and you and another kid had to share three marshmallows and one hot dog. Um, and he talked about nature, and he talked about like the church of nature. And he was an amazing guy, and I think he influenced all our lives. But I loved it so much. Like, I went from the time I was five till the time I was 20. I went back and, you know, got to ride with my head up. Um, <laughs> but I went back to sort of take care of the other kids. And, and, you know, even though it was just this little city park in Pennsylvania, Monocacy Park, um, I think probably that's one huge reason why, you know, as soon as I graduated from high school, I was like, going west, <laughs> you know? Um, he taught us how to love camping and how to respect the woods and how to be smart in them. He taught all of the kids in my neighborhood that. He took 20, 30 kids at a time. It was amazing. It was like the unofficial Boy Scouts, you know. Um, way in the back. What has the ranch uh, taught you that has surprised you the most? Um, I don't know if this is surprised. The ranch has taught me to be still. And I would have said I'm incapable of being still. And I'm still not very good at it. <laughs> But I say this in the book, but it's true. Like any amount of calmness or stillness or lack of anxiety that I can come up with, <laughs> which isn't much, uh, I owe to the ranch. I owe to sitting on the porch and watching the light change on the meadow. Um, it's, taught me, it's taught me the value of being still even though I don't achieve that very often. I think we can do one more quick question. So, over here. Hey, you sort of primed us for an animal story. <laughs> uh, um, and those sheep look quite interesting. I, I have no idea what sort of sheep those are. And those are Icelandic sheep, okay. in fact. And, um, and do you have a funny story about Icelandic sheep? Oh, God. I do. <laughs> um, it's kind of long. Um, I have a donkey story. Can I tell you a donkey story? I can tell that one quicker. The Icelandic one is too long to tell because we're out of time, <coughs> and I know everybody wants to get home. But if you buy the snowing. book, it's hilarious. But if you buy the book, yes. The, the Icelandic sheep story is in there. But here's the donkey story, which is also in there. But... It's such a good one. So I brought these two mini donkeys home, 
and the dogs were absolutely affronted. They did not, like, they did not think, I, I let the donkeys sort of have the run of the place, and the dogs would chase the donkeys, and the donkeys would chase the dogs, and one reason I, I had to um, leave the donkeys out is because the way my pasture is fenced, the donkeys were so little they could walk through the walk-arounds, you know, for the people. Anyway, um, there was a lot of dog-donkey tension, and I, and I kept thinking it might go away, it might go away. Well, one day after the donkeys had been there for a couple months, I had to go to the valley to buy a bunch of supplies, and I left the donkeys and the horses in the yard, and I left the horses, I mean, sorry, I left the, the dogs in the house so that the donkeys and the horses could have their way and eat the green grass, the sweet grass in the yard. And there's a porch that belongs to the dogs. It's where they eat, it's where they sleep when they're not inside. It's completely the dog porch. All their stuff is on it. And I had noticed that the donkeys had walked up the stairs on their little hooves to the dog porch to really check it out. You know, they were like sniffing the dog beds and sniffing the dog bowls. They did that a lot. And then they'd clip clop down off the porch. They're only like this big. They're actually shorter than the dogs. Um, and so I go to the valley and I come back loaded with stuff. And Deseo, my Pasifino, was running and running and running and running up and down the fence line, which means something terrible's happened. So I go flying up the driveway and I catch Deseo and he seems fine. And there's the donkeys and they seem fine. And I see my other horse, and he's fine, and the sheep are in their pen, and the chickens are fine, and I'm like, well, what was the problem? And just, it was all frothed up. So I go to start unloading the groceries, and I walk up across the dog porch, which is how I get to the door, and the donkeys have shit <laughs> all over the dog porch, like not once or twice or four times, but they have covered the dog porch in shit like they had been saving up for weeks <laughs> and somehow knew when I was going to go to the valley. And, and they had picked up the dog beds with their teeth and flung them and then shit on them. And they shit into an open cooler that I had drying on the dog porch. And they kicked over the dog bowls and shit in them. Like, it was the most amazing... It was like a fraternity prank, except, <laughs> except you know, somehow it had been carried out by only the two of them. It remains a great mystery. And of course, they had done this with the dogs, like noses pressed on the kitchen window, looking at the dog porch, like watching them shit all over everything. And uh, so anyway, that was the final straw, and I got some cement, and I closed up those gaps, and everybody had their own space after that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Let's thank Karen Avanon and yeah. Pam Houston for a fantastic conversation. And thank you all for coming. Please join us in the lobby for a book signing.